<laughs> okay, almost ready. Testing. One, two. Yeah, I think we're good with the microphone. Let's see, do I have to do anything here? Trying a new setup here. Testing. One, two. Okay. <laughs> Had to blow my nose. I think I'm okay. Alright. Time to get started. Let's see. I'm using OBS. So maybe I can completely, instead of using this janky setup that I've always used, then I can move this over here. And then I can close this one, I think. Um, oh, dang. I messed up. Oh, no, here it is. Oh, no, this is over here. Oh, yeah, I get it. Okay. <laughs> Hello, welcome to the Black Ponder. Um, oh, no, I, let's see. Got to do this chat. Uh, okay, that's nice. And we got just Nadia in here, I think. If I'm reading this correctly. Hello. Nice new spot. How was the move in? Uh, move in was... Uh, all time consuming but we did it but i'm not finished yet as you can see there is stuff still we got to organize <laughs> and you're just but for the most part everything is set up but we need a garage we bought one of those sheds that you could buy at like a hardware store those those ones you could just assemble on your own uh just so i can put some of this garage stuff <laughs> but it's fine yeah so that was like all-consuming in the move um, it was like the only thing I ever did in my life <laughs> um, I see why people hire movers right <laughs> uh, yeah cuz I moved house it, it, before then I moved an apartment to a house so I had a lot less things but now with the house to an, one house to another house that it, it just consumed my entire life every moment of the week was just move, was about to move so yeah you know, but it's fine you know it's over but i see why because i was like yeah i don't need to be dealing with no movers i could do it all by myself you know i'm, I'm strong <laughs> but, <laughs> just, but you <laughs> you think and then it's like you know certain things are heavy and uh you know they, we had to act fortunately i had friends to help and family that helped uh, but still it was just a lot of stuff uh, and then you got to clean up the old place because I rented. Oh, it was just, just I had to make sure that I was spotless to get the keys to the landlord. Be like, here you go, man. Okay, you know, bye bye. It's all cleaned up. But you know, we did it. But still, in disarray. We, but uh, it's coming together. And did I watch the clips? Yeah, I, I watched the clips. I did it while um, <laughs> I went to the laundry mat. <laughs> and I just walked outside the laundry mat and I looked up. See, I, in Memphis, we are um, in Tennessee, Memphis. We're close to the the totality, of whatever the hell it's called, uh, where it's like 100%. We was like, I think we had 95% of the sun was covered up, or maybe even more than that. But it wasn't all of it. <laughs> like in, um, it's too bad because I I have relatives in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, which that's like 100% the sun, but it's like a, 
Um, how long is that drive? It's like a three hour drive, probably a little longer. <laughs> um, so I couldn't, and then I had all these, that, that was while I was moving. Uh, so I just couldn't do it. And we had this dog and all this other stuff. It's too bad. But but the, um, the 96% <laughs> coverage, it was pretty cool. You know, I had my um, Eclipse glasses, and as you know, you can see the sun, little, uh, just a little, uh, what is it, sliver. <laughs> it was pretty cool, and it got really dark. And you know, some people are, they get all paranoid. They're like, "Oh my God, the world's ending." We, you know, I live, we live in the South, so we gotta deal with it. But you know, most people was kind of cool. A lot of people just ignored it. They're like, "Eh, whatever." It's just, <laughs> you know, some people are just going about their day. But I took some time, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm a." relax I got on top of my car and just laid on the roof <laughs> to look at it <laughs> you know, that's what I did <laughs> Toronto was 95% or something I drove three hour to be in the full totality where there weren't any clouds yeah I think that would probably have been worth it yeah I wish I could have did that but you know responsibilities um, but it was too bad because I have family over there. <laughs> but, you know, the 95%, that was pretty cool, too. That was pretty cool, too. <laughs> so, uh, but it was cool. I liked it. Okay, so welcome uh, to the Black Ponder, in case people are watching that aren't familiar. Um, the Black Ponder is a YouTube channel where we talk about philosophy, and specifically we talk about philosophical texts. Or we're talking about texts that have philosophical themes in them. Uh, but we also do live streams. And that's more just to talk about specific topics philosophically. And today is a viewer request. And I forgot the name of the viewer that requested it. <laughs> but, but it was definitely a request. It was about elitism. They said, hey, why don't you talk about elitism? Um, sure. I could do that. <laughs> uh, I don't know specifically what the, the, the interest was, uh, but I can give you my two cents and maybe the person requester will join in. Not sure. Maybe, maybe not, but we'll see. So I'll just, first of all, I will read um, the description of my um, stream. <laughs> so I, I wrote classism, one of the oldest forms of oppression. It is. Classism is older than racism. Right? I don't. I don't think it's older than sexism, but it's by older than racism for sure. Uh, it's discrimination based on socioeconomic status, mm -hmm. how rich and how famous you are, and you know how well known. It's that social power, financial power. The elite is the label used to describe those at the top of this hierarchical system. The elite. Um, it's not just a buzzword, you know, people use it a lot, I know, <laughs> um, I think, uh, the politician Bernie Sanders, he really, like, you know, gave that, that term, um, like, credit, <laughs> like, because at first, people like, oh, you're elite, it's like this term that you just throw around, and it's this buzzword, but when Bernie Sanders, the senator of Vermont, I think, when he was, I think it's Vermont, when he was, um, using it, people were kind of taking it more seriously, right? Um, you know, the, the elite, because, you know, it, it, this is probably true everywhere in the world, but I know in the United States of America, a small fraction of the population controls most of the wealth in this country, right? And those are the elites, <laughs> what we, we call them. And in recent times, the term 99% has been used uh, to describe, uh oh, used, uh, that's a typo there. Maybe I could do this in real time. Save. <laughs> it has been used to describe how the vast majority of people are not members of the elite. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about. And then we, you had the whole Occupy Wall Street movement that happened why ways back. This is like during the Great Recession. I remember that. 2000, the late knots, 2008, 2009, 2010 maybe. I don't know. Um. It was just people uh, setting up camps and banks and businesses, you know, like financial institutions and just setting up camp. And, you know, that's when that term 99%, that's when I first heard of it. I'm sure, you know, the term has been around for a while. 
but that's when I first heard about it and people were just saying like why is it that the vast majority of us <laughs> don't have uh, any of the wealth <laughs> right it is true um, and then I say when an incredibly minuscule number of the population controls almost all wealth how does this affect society let's discuss mm -hmm. and then we have Lionel Daniel uh, hello how have you been doing been doing cool so you know as I was saying before this is and we don't have the most aesthetically pleasing background because I'm you know, at the tail end of moving house so it's a lot of like packages all over the place um, but you know it's a tail end so we're, we 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 um, we're completing <laughs> it's almost finished uh, but you know not the most aesthetically pleasing environment but it are my videos ever aesthetically pleasing? <laughs> we, we stay lo-fi here on the Black Ponder. That's how we do. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> we're talking about elitism. But, you know, so when you talk about elitism, you got to talk about classism. And you got to talk about socioeconomics. You know, you got to talk about finance. Because, um, and, then you, at the, and then you have to talk about discrimination and oppression because that's what classism is it's interesting right um you know there's that term um popular you know really developed heavily by black feminism intersectionality right in which they you know they, the concept of there's all different kinds of discrimination and they work in tangent together but in a kind of matrix right there's not just one form of oppression you know there's many different kinds and some people intersect within various different kinds and it affects them differently than somebody else so we're talking about and we could talk and we could discuss that where you talk about you know um, a white person that's poor has you know that's a form of oppression poor people the oppression on poor people is a real thing but then you look at somebody else who's like a black person who's poor and their whole their experience of depression is 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 different <laughs> it's similar to the white person's poor but it's different right and and so when you you know i think that's kind of important to think about too the intersections of um different forms of oppression because people, we like to think um and, and and then we can really delve into this right because there's kind of this whole idea that's pushed around in mainstream thought <laughs> like you know really it all comes down to classism right that's what you know all forms of oppression when you really get down to the nitty gritty of it like racism sexism homophobia like it's all really just a class based thing right it's all really just capitalism it's the ultimate boogeyman that creates all this crap right well i don't know about that <laughs> i in fact I, I don't think that's the case uh, but yeah we can't forget about class class is important uh, a factor to consider when we talk about discrimination but it definitely isn't the only factor right whereas you know somebody who is in a, like a black elite for instance like somebody who's got a lot of money and a lot of fame uh, but they're you know african-american or or whatever you know they're black in a, in a in a eurocentric uh, society they're gonna still be oppressed in, in ways right um, but then they they're able to evade a lot of the oppression that <laughs> that is experienced from poor people that maybe a poor white person would experience and so on and so forth right um, so that's something to talk about too right. but you know what I guess what we want to first discuss uh, and then feel free to jump into the comment section and add some points if you want to you know and also I'm not like hardcore about staying on topic you know we need to stay on the, of course you know we want to kind of stay on the topic but you know if you want to like throw some tangent that's cool but i always reroute to the um, the original topic so you know that's fine but you know what what we were talking about before about um, how 
most wealth is concentrated in a small concentra- <laughs> in a small populace um, and that's the state of affairs currently right uh, what we have and I, f- I first became aware of this during the Great Depre- Recession the Great Depression now, I wasn't born then but that was my grandma's generation like the silent generation it's funny what you think about um, the various generations. I think about my grandma who, you know, passed away. I talked about that. You know, we talked about grief. <laughs> uh, but my grandma was of the silent generation, so she was all about saving up. She was like, you know, she never put money in the mattress, but she was of that generation. <laughs> like, you know, very misery. She would uh, uh, be save up, like she would she was a packer what do you call a hoarder yeah she was a hoarder <laughs> she would um she didn't couldn't throw things away right because she li- li- grew up in the era during the great depression who where um, uh you know it was hard to get valuable things right so that carried over right that carried over and i'm just thinking about um how that impacted her life and, and so i think about how i grew up well, I, I didn't grow up. Well, I did, you know, I, I grew up during the whole boom, the whole economic explosion of the, the late 80s and 90s, right? Um, the dot-com boom. <laughs> I grew up there, but I wasn't really a part of that, right? Uh, really what affected me was what is now known as the Great Recession, which was caused by uh, many things, right? Many things, but primarily it was caused by the housing crisis, where people uh, pulled out mortgages for houses, and then it, it came to the realization like people couldn't afford these mortgages, and you know, so 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 many people couldn't afford these mortgages for these houses, nobody could pay the money, and so the whole like market collapsed. <laughs> um, and I remember that because a lot of people who I, I just finished college, I actually just finished graduate school <laughs> I got a master's. Um, and, you know, I talked to a lot of my friends who remember this of my age, how we, um, you know, our parent, our, the baby boomer generation who, who, who lived through that whole, you know, a lot of the economic benefits of the baby boom generation who were used to like oh if you get a college degree you're guaranteed a job you're just you're, you know college guarantees you a job college degrees guarantee you security financial security with a college degree you can buy a house you can you know because back then <laughs> college degrees are still pretty cool um, but you know now it's <laughs> it's not like in the baby boomer generation right <laughs> where and so we were told this as kids, my mama and, you know, because they, you know, uh, that's what they knew. But then we we got our degrees and then there was like no jobs <laughs> and like, you know, everything was expensive. Right? Rent was like outrageous. Right. And it, that's still true to this day. Right. Um, and it was this whole disillusion that happened right? where. And I, I definitely remember this is like the, the late 2000s, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011. It was this, um, this disillusion. Like people were like, wow, college doesn't, higher education doesn't guarantee you financial security. <laughs> like, like what my parents told me. And then, you know, you would pull all these loans to be thinking to pay for the college thinking like oh i'll just be able to pay for it back because i'll get a good job and a lot that didn't happen for many many people (laughs) Uh, unlike like the baby boomer generation right where um college wasn't as expensive nowhere near as as expensive and you know people i remember my mom telling me oh i got paid to go to school like the government gave so many educational grants that you would just you would get money right just to go to school which is the exact opposite of, of what i experienced in a lot of people and, and so what happens is you have this whole generation me generation y the millennial generation and you know it, it carries on to generation z and to a, uh, a lesser extent generation x experienced that too the generation before me um 
yeah, yeah, I would say lesser, but not like too lesser because you know my my wife, who is Generation X, a few years older than me, same thing happened to her, right? But I know a lot of people who are like a few years older than me, Generation X, uh, kind of the same similar experience, right? Uh, but so what happens is like uh, so you you finish college, right? And you're steep in um, debt. You know, tens of thousands of dollars in debt, right? You you can't really get a you get like a job that's like close to minimum wage, <laughs> and you know a lot of my friends to this day are still in this situation. You know, o- approaching the age of forty, right? Uh, they got like you know bachelor's degrees or some you know even graduate degrees, but they can't move forward, and they have this crushing debt. And so what happens is like you know they can't wealth cannot be generated like it can't be created right and 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 so the you know how that works you know and i'm just thinking this through you know i'm just thinking about um the situation that we are in now and the history of it right and you look at like the richest people or the people with the most money and you're like it is a small fraction and then you think about well how how did they get all that money did they go was it college did they degree do it no (laughs) right uh they inherited the money right they inherited the money you know and you know and you, you think about how most wealth today is based off of intergeneration intergeneration most wealth is intergenerational right meaning like wealth isn't earned it's just inherited, right? Uh, the the idea, you know, what we were taught uh, was like, oh, you know, if maybe you don't you don't have wealth, you go to college, you get an education, and then you can get a good dr- degree, and then you can create wealth. You can create your own wealth, but <laughs> that that's not happening, right? It's not happening for most people. Uh, you know, you, you see the people who are really rich and well to do and you look at their and it's funny because I, I look at the people I know who are very financially uh, well off and you know the most of those people in fact I don't know anybody who's like very financially well off personally and this is just anecdotal so you know I'm not trying to say like this is the case everywhere it's just my experience but you know definitely chime in if you have a different experience, but all the people that I know who are like they got a lot of they do they got six figure salaries, let's say. Um, it wasn't their education that gave them six figures. It was it was a hookup. <laughs> it was you, and it's mostly a family hookup. Somebody's like, oh, I'm just gonna get my son into this thing, you know. Or you know, I I know people who their family had a spare house. And they're like, oh, we're just going to give this house to my to my kid. <laughs> so they got handed over a house. Which is, you know, not to guilt trip anybody. Like, you know, because I mean, I'd, I'd do the same thing if I had a spare house, right? But the thing is, like, the house wasn't earned. And, and, and the other thing to consider is wealth is not, um, it's not earned, right? So you look at, <laughs> it's inherited, right? So you look at the elite class. And you know, and it's important to understand, like we're not like just trying to shame people. <laughs> we're not trying to. I'm not. I'm not doing that. I'm not saying like these people are suck because they didn't earn their money. We just, you know, it's just interesting because that's the kind of this myth that we're taught. Like, you know, if you work hard, you'll earn, you'll develop wealth. And it's like that. That's not how it works. <laughs> Uh, I don't, th- you know, specifically here in the United States of America, but I don't think that's how it works anywhere, right? <laughs> like, wealth isn't earned, wealth is inherited. Like, uh, elitism isn't something that um, is earned. Elitism is something that's inherited. Very, in- very <laughs> it's funny because it's kind of like how it was in, um, you know, uh, monarchy, mon- monarch times, <laughs> where you look at, like, um, you know, royalty and things like that. <laughs> it's like, and it, it, uh, it in that way is not very different. <laughs> um, 
I'm trying to uh, think about how what I should say, but you know, I'm just being honest. I'm just keeping it real. I'm just keeping it real. So I, I work for, you know, an example would be I work for FedEx. I work for <laughs> FedEx, the shipping company. You know, that's you know my current like nine to five job. You know, the president of uh, the f the founder of FedEx, his name is Fred Smith. Uh, he stepped down because he's getting a, a bit older. He's getting old. He hasn't retired yet, but he has kind of stepped down from a lot of his leadership positions. And you want to think like, okay, who's the who's the who's the leader? Who who took his place? His son. His son took his Richard Richard Smith <laughs> took his place. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I'm not not to say. I mean, you know, would I would I do the same thing for my child? If I probably right. <laughs> Uh, but you know, if you got some critique about that, I mean, that's fair too, right? What you call that nepotism, right? Where it's like, he, uh, what, what I mean when I when I mention this is, um, you know, this is still true today, right? The elites are just, you know, they're handed down from their inheritance, right? <laughs> And it's just funny when I think about that. It's like it, it's hard to like. Well, I would do the same thing, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, this that's how the system works. <laughs> that's how our economics work. Is a lot of the flow of wealth is intergenerational. Right? You work for FedEx, uh, and then some of your you are, yeah, yeah. Sorry, the little icon. I had this icon that's blocking. Yeah, I work for FedEx. I've been uh, working for so you know, I mean that's part of this story too. Uh, you know, my dream. I'm I'm really into video games. <laughs> Huge gamer. Huge gamer. My dream growing up was like I'm a I'm a work for the video game industry. I'm a work for the video game industry. I actually just bought some games. Tangent. <laughs> oh, you can't see it. It's Claire. Final Fantasy, baby. <laughs> Arbor Core, what's up? That's the other the that's the game that that company that makes Dark Souls. They also make Armor Core. <laughs> that game's awesome. Uh, and others, I, I was just like so. My dream, <laughs> my dream was always to work for a video game company, right? And so I studied computer science in school because I'm like you know I, I want to learn how to program. So, you know, I got a deg degree in computer programming, uh, computer science, right? and I tried to break into the game industry, right? But that was during the time uh, of the Great Recession. So everybody and their mama was <laughs> trying to get, try to break in. So you had like, for every job opening, it was like 200 people, applicants, right? So of course, in those situations, you're just going to get the cream of the crop, the the people who learned how to program when they were like four years old, right? <laughs> they're like master programmers and shit. Those are the people that got those jobs. Or there are people that their their parents or their family members work for the company and they kind of gave them a, you know, that is that, that situation. Uh, while I was going to college, I also worked for FedEx as a like a package handler, like the entry level position. Just you know, in most people, many people when they go to college, they have a a job, part-time job to support there. They, you know, I was one of those. Right? Um, you know, and I, I worked for FedEx throughout my entire college career, <laughs> uh, doing the package. I, I rose from the from the ground up. Um, you know, thinking like, okay, you know, FedEx. You know, um, that's just some supplementary thing I, I just needed for to pay for my textbooks <laughs> and like my class expenses and all that. Um, and, but you know the dream, the dream is to uh, uh, work for a company, even uh, for a video game company. <laughs> Eventually, I got hired to work for uh, Namco Bandai as a game tester <laughs> because that was the only openings they had. Game testers, you don't need a college degree. You just you, you, you play video games while they're being developed, and you like spot bugs uh, and glitches, so they can like you, you report them, and then the company like works on them makes them better <laughs> right uh, and you know 
and that was the only job that was available. <laughs> was gay. It, it's an entry level position. You get paid like it's close to minimum wage. But I was like, you know what? I'm. It's fine. I'll just I'll I'll work my way up. You know. Um, eventually, though, what I I found out was the video game industry is like toxic as fuck <laughs> it's like really toxic it's like yeah so you know ga- what they call it gamer gate and like um it's very sexist it's actually very racist too and it's it it quite fascinating because um i worked for namco bandai the people that the company that make pac-man and <laughs> they would have J- japanese um people from japan that work for you know the japanese section of namco they would come um, you know, to America, to the in the office that I was working in in America, and even those Japanese people were racist as fuck, which was like that was shocking to me. I'm like, and they were like sexist and shit. I was like, what the fuck? It's like this whole industry, and it ain't just Americans. It's like this whole company globally is fucked up. <laughs> and then I learned later, like, oh, this industry is is toxic. It's, so I had to get the fuck out of there. It's too bad. It's too bad. Uh, but I could go on, uh, and I just stayed at FedEx, and I slowly just kept getting up, 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 up. Eventually, I made this decision. It's like you know what, life is hard. <laughs> You're not gonna get your dream job. I got, you know, I started like, um, I also I had crush, you know, loan debt that I had to pay off. I was like. I need to. I started applying for real full-time positions at FedEx. Uh, you know, I was like, you know, I'll make my video game on the side. <laughs> I'll make a video game like as a hobby on the side. That'll just be my fun thing, kind of like what I do here with the YouTube. Uh, but I gotta get more realistic about this and have a, a steady source of income. And so I decided, yeah, I'll just, um, you know, get a job for a real full-time position. I started applying, and eventually, like, oh, okay, you've already worked for the company for like 10 years already we'll give you this spot you're familiar you got a master's degree here you know and so i you know i moved to the headquarters and that, and there you have it uh, but yes yeah, it's, it's things like that like that and it's interesting when you tie that back into elitism and how like circumstances both economic and um social economic right really dictate who's an elite and who isn't right and then let me see some comments here uh nadia says i know so too many people from high school who i see pop up in linkedin and they have seemingly made up job names like senior account executive chief (laughs) and although their parents just got them in with yeah their companies right 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 (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I know. It's funny, LinkedIn people do that on LinkedIn, right? They're like, uh, uh, it's funny because I have a weird job title too. My my job title is senior project management analyst. <laughs> like, yeah, I didn't make that one up, but but it, it's kind of along the same lines of what does that even mean? <laughs> no, <it's> just, <laughs> you know, but yeah, but it's funny when people really just kind of make it up. But we live in that kind of world. I am a knowledgeable person. Uh Well, thanks. Uh, There's a lot of, uh, you know, not to diss, you know, I have no shade for FedEx, you know, FedEx, you know, FedEx is a corporation and, you know, they're they're business and, um, you know, I give, I make good money from them. (laughs) You know, cat, it it is what it is. Like, is it my dream job? No, (laughs) but not trying to throw shade <laughs> you know uh, so then you know there's plenty of knowledgeable people that work for fedex there's much there's a lot of smart more smarter people than me but you can tell a lot of people that work at fedex they're like yeah this is my plan b <laughs> which is not to knock the company but that's just how it is <laughs> um, and then nadia says bullshit jobs by david graber is really good um, Graber claimed that 20-50% of jobs are bullshit was based on polling that asked whether people thought their work is making meaningful proper, uh, meaningful contribution mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah and you know if you want to get all it, that's true and you, if you, I, I agree with that uh, 
and it, we can even get all Marxist about it, right? Where Marx talked about um, how you know our current way of working dehumanizes us, where you know we don't we no longer find meaning in our our work, where our work becomes um, um, you know detached. We become alienated. That's like the the phrase or the the um, the term that's like used in uh, Marxism alienation because our work alienates us we don't feel attached to our um, the work that we do and it and it makes us feel meaningless <laughs> which is you know I've experienced that and I agree with that I don't agree with everything with Marx but a lot of things he said was was true and I, I think that's true um, most yeah it's true most people was you say 20 50 percent of jobs are bullshit Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's something to consider. Yeah, like most jobs, people aren't really doing anything at all. <laughs> I know that because I work in a, you know, it, from my experience working in the office, and this is true. Like not at just like, you know, it, it, it isn't true in any industry, right? Not just like logistics, FedEx, but like even in the video game industry, you look at the person is like, wait, what do you actually do? <laughs> you just kind of just walk around and pretend to do stuff when you really just don't do anything. <laughs> that's true but then to go further down the route that we were just talking about like you know most people don't enjoy their work right and most people consider their job like look I'm just uh, this is just a paycheck to me which is sad you know most people it's like that's a, their, the paycheck um, I, I'll never forget I, one time I was at uh, some bar <laughs> I was at a bar and I was there was these people I was just kind of joining in on this conversation that these two women were having, and one of the women women was saying, uh, you know, she was talking about, hey, you know, everybody knows um, when you work a job, you you just you know five days out of the week you don't do something you don't want to do, and then on the weekend you enjoy your life, like that's just life. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> And, and I'm like, you just, you accept that? Like, that that's just something you accept. Like, most of your life sucks. Right? <laughs> Two days out of the week is your time. Five days out of the week is the company's time. <laughs> that's what, that's why people throw out the term wage slavery. Right? <laughs> it's like, you know, when you go, sign it, you know, when you punch in your corporation, when you work, it's like, all right, corporation, you got me. Like, my life is yours for the time I'm here, and you know nowadays companies will um, will have you work, you know, outside the company. Like you take, you have like a, a company laptop. You take it home. You gotta do work at home and shit. <laughs> you know, uh, you, you know, or you're like you're thinking about the project as you're eating dinner. The company, you know, it's like the company has your. And why are you doing this? Is like. Are you doing this to help progress yourself, your humanity? No, you're just doing this to progress the uh, interests of the company. <laughs> and the company's sole purpose is to just generate profit and reduce profit margins, right? <laughs> so that's all really it's all, all about. And so your life becomes, um, you know, your life just becomes uh, <laughs> a way for companies to generate profit. Which is kind of sad. And then you say his solution at the end of the book is UBI. I don't know what UBI is. But I do know David Graeber. I have a friend who keeps talking about David Graeber like all the time. He loves David Graeber. <laughs> so I definitely need to hop on that David Graeber. Uh, that tra David Graeber uh, train because he's like isn't he like anarchist universal basic income oh, damn uh, I'm down for that some people were like no that's gonna make people lazy <laughs> it's like um, yeah universal basic income I mean eventually I mean I guess you can call me a socialist now but eventually like I would like to see a world where there's just income is just a, a thing that's not even doesn't even exist right <laughs> it's like you know your basic needs are met and you don't need an income right <laughs> to like survive but 
and it's a, and people would argue like well that how's that going to motivate people to achieve things it's like i don't know i think people will be able to achieve things you know what <laughs> you know on their own just for the satisfaction of achieving and not everybody needs to achieve stuff and some people just want to chill and hang out and have a good time and enjoy life and just chill, you know and that ain't, ain't ain't nothing wrong with that either shit i don't know he was a big part of Occupy Wall Street. Okay. Oh, that's too bad. He passed away to COVID. But I love him. He's great. I ran to him in the book. Yeah, I think you and my friend would very much enjoy me reading some of him. <laughs> Look at the book. I think I recommended it to you before, but I know. Yeah, I do have a long list. The Dawn of Everything. Maybe I will have that as part of my book club recommendations because I'm part of a anarchist book club and then that'll force me to read it I will put this in my notes and be like hey this is the next book we should read the dawn of everything oh it's by Graber and Wingrow so it's another author too cool cool so yeah you um you know, we, we the topic was elitism, but um, we we kind of ventured more into the territory of um, you know uh, the people who are not elites, <laughs> the average Joes, the average Janes, <laughs> the people who are like outside of that, which is most people, right? I wonder. Um, I, it, it was Lionel Daniel. Are, are you the one that recommended this? If not, I wonder if the person is um, who recommended this topic um, is here. <laughs> I don't know because I don't think I have anything else to say about it, <laughs> to be honest. But if anybody has any questions, or comments, uh, or you know things they want to bring up about elitism. Uh, feel free to throw it in the chat. But, um, yeah, I don't really have much else, you know, um, because I, I look at the whole class warfare. It's, it's largely a systemic issue. So are elites the one to blame? Um, well, the system is to blame, right? Now, elites... Perpetuate that system, and they have a, a responsibility. You know, they're responsible for doing that, but they're not the only ones responsible for doing it, right? Uh, they're a huge part of it, but we also, you know, the middle class also perpetuates the this whole system that enables the elite to exist, right? Um, and, so, and because we don't really call attention to it now the 99 percent that that whole occupy wall street that was a um that was an attempt to call attention to this problem and that's cool that's cool to see um so it's cool to break bring it out and to talk about these things I, you know i also so i'm also part of um this activist group called food not bombs which i mentioned before and today was we had one of our feeding days where we go out into a park and we set up like food and we just give it to people <laughs> just you know we just have a, a food table and people just show up anybody it could be anybody all right and then one person i was talking to he was adamant about like how we should just accept or we should um be happy about what democrats here in america the democratic party here in america is doing which I say, yeah, no, nah, that's that, no. <laughs> right? Right? And I think that kind of attitude is like, yeah, we need to support Democrats, and you know, they're, uh, you know, they're making progress. Is like, eh, it, yeah, no, like, you know, I'm not, you know, if we're, if we're talking about American politics, you know, there's Republicans and Democrats and all this bullshit. Right? I'm not on either side, but I think both sides are really fucking up <laughs> our situation and we need to call them out on it basically 
we need to call them out. And we got to tell, we got to be loud about it and say, like, look, you guys are really dropping the ball. And, you know, when I say dropping the ball, it, it sounds like I'm, they're making a mistake. They're not making a mistake, right? They're doing, they're, ju- they're just doing things to, in their personal interests, but they're not. And Democrats are guilty of this too, you know. Um, and, you know, you could all talk about, and, you know, I made, videos about this before like who do you vote for republican democrat lesser of two evils sure sure you you know i I, for the most part i i vote for people of the democratic party but i i do that with no expectation that (laughs) these these uh yahoos (laughs) these people these people who are uh part of um who are members of the Democrat? Are they gonna like do anything in the interests of the general public? And they're just gonna do things of the interests of the elite, <laughs> right? The elite class. And then so then there's this argument, this anarchist argument. It's like, well, why are you voting? You're just supporting a system that's is like, well, you know, it's more complicated than that. I, so I can understand, like, you know, you gotta be involved in it, right? And, and um, but you have to be, you have to be aware of what you're doing. And, and so that, that's why I was talking to this guy that was we were giving him food and he was like yeah I'm a proud Democrat and I'm like ah, that's that's amazing <laughs> you can be proud considering like what Joe you know our president Joe Biden what he's doing <laughs> I mean, you know he does he has done some good things let's not make no mistake I mean he has done some, but he's done a lot of shitty things too right and you know he's always been He's, he's been in uh, politics uh, for his whole life. Like, he was in politics in the 60s, 1960s. I think. And, yeah, if you look at his track record, he's, you know, he's not the best. But is he better than Trump? You know, um, I would argue yes, by how much, very minuscule. But, you know, that minuscule can be a lot. So I vote for him. But, I, don't, I you know, when I vote for him, I have no expectation. Like, he's not going to save America or anything like that. You know, Grant, he's going to do... And we see this with the whole thing, how he's operating um, his pullout with Afghanistan and, uh, you know, how he's, like, funding the military in support of Israel. You know, all this shit. And, you know, why is he doing all this? He's supporting the elites. That's that's what government does. <laughs> all right, if you... And we could take it that direction. Like, you, you see government supporting the interests of elites, right? And, um... You know, and I think Democrats in the United States of America, that party is really a Democrat, uh, a party for elites. Whereas Republicans, they're kind of more of this cult thing that's going on. <laughs> they're becoming kind of really disillusioned with reality. And, you know, they'll, you know, they don't even care so much about elitism anymore. They're just kind of like, it's, it's like a religious cult now. I mean, they're buying into uh, <laughs> like uh, conspiracy theories and shit. <laughs> it's, just, it's just weird. It's just weird. And it's really like, I mean, I, I, I always say that's worse. Some people say like, well, it's the same. No, no, that's just like out of batshit crazy. At least with the, <laughs> the Democrats, there's, a th- you know, there there's a way to, uh, <laughs> there's like a logic to what they're doing is what I'm saying. <laughs> so, uh but yeah I, I, you know if we talk about elitism like i would say the democratic party in the united states of america is a party that serves the elite right which is a huge problem right and so and so how do you combat that you gotta be you gotta call it out you gotta let people know and you can't be like well you know he's doing the best that he can and uh you know we're talking about the president or whoever like vice president kamala here she's doing the best that she can and you know you have like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, and they're doing the best that they can. And it's like no, no, no. We gotta we gotta push further. We gotta expect more from our because people will throw in those type of names. Oh, you know you got the what they call them, the squad, <laughs> the squad, which is you know they, these are the young people, the the few, Omar, Iliad, or I'm sorry, I, I, I messed up her name. I have a, I, you know I'm I'm not dissing these people. Um, but at the end of the day, you look at government and American politics. But you know, honestly, just look at politics throughout the world, and you see like a, a, a system that just caters to elites. Right? It doesn't cater to the general public. Um, 
because if they did cater to the general public we would have free health care we'd have like free education <laughs> we'd have like uh you know the, uh, the end of homelessness <laughs> we you know if they're if that's what they're doing they wouldn't be they wouldn't be just going to other countries and just blowing them up right <laughs> or like finance you know using our tax dollars to do that shit right i mean but that does help the elite class does it not so you know you can take it in that direction too right not to get like too political but <laughs> there you go there you go um yeah so you know that's all i had to say about elitism it was a viewer request i'm not sure if the person that requested it is here <laughs> uh which is fine that's fine you know i said my piece if nobody else has anything else to uh to ask or uh, contribute to that um, topic then i think it's time for us to conclude with the um the stream could be like a relatively short one even though it's, it's about an hour or so it's about that time about that time we check out but I, I just want to thank you for watching the the show and I haven't been I'll show you what I'm going to be talking about next the next video I'm doing right here we got this my ring light is giving the glare it's a little booklet it's part, I, I'm part of several book clubs and this is one of our book club books it's, we will not cancel us and other dreams of transformative justice by adrian marie brown and I, I like adrian marie brown author she also wrote this book which i probably will make a video about called pleasure activism and she's done she's wrote quite a few cool things uh, but you know it's about how like the left is um infighting and now we're getting we're getting to the point where it's starting to cancel each other <laughs> like literally like we're just talking shit about each other and we're in and, and it's come to the point where you know they, the infighting between within the left activist groups is going to let to extreme so she's talking about how to deal with that and i think that's an interesting topic to just talk about generally how like you know how to work with with or how organizations can work with other organizations who does who don't agree how to move forward but agree with where should we go <laughs> not they don't agree about how should we how should we move forward but they definitely agree about where <laughs> we should be going right and how to like work with organizations that have different methods of moving of progress right and and not just like talking shit about each other and like throwing shade at each other right and doing that twitter warfare crap right uh, and I think you could extend that um, outward and not just focus on like activism, leftist activism, but just in general. <laughs> like, how do you, you know, work with, you know, like when we talk about philosophy um, and there's different, different, various schools of philosophical thought, um, how do you engage with people who, you know, who are into like, I, um, Ayn Rand <laughs> or like you know because I'm not a fan of her but uh, I could talk to somebody intelligently about and not like say you're an idiot <laughs> you know or you know all this other shit like um, um, you know all these other like uh, stoicism or um, transcendentalism <laughs> or you know I'm trying to extend it or make it um, you know you, you, you could do it within all fields same thing with with science right where it's like you know in, in the science community whether it be astronomy cosmology we were talking about the eclipse earlier uh you know the whole there's all types of debates happening within the scientific community about like things like string theory <laughs> or uh, you know um, even stuff like what to finance in terms of like should we finance going to like different another planet or should we like put money into building a new collider that smashes atoms you know what was it so it, it, instead of like throwing shade at each other just talking shit about each other which is kind of what's going on <laughs> through the social media how do you deal with that how do you deal with that that's what we're gonna be talking about with this video. i thought this was a really good book to like address that 
which I think is actually a real concern. Um, and it's kind of the reason why I started this channel because I felt like discourse was hitting rock bottom. It's like people don't know how to talk with other people who they disagree with in a constructive way anymore. <laughs> or like, you know, now we've come to the point where, well, if you can't agree with somebody, if you disagree with somebody, you can't, you can't make progress. Where so it's like, when did it come to that? You could totally make progress bouncing off ideas and like um you know debating with somebody you know where it's like the debate is not about winning it's about like trying to find the right answer <laughs> you know it's like it's you know the debate is pushing you toward like correct or truth it's not about like well i won no i won it's like that's not what this is about. <laughs> but we've come to this point and it's sad and i think social media and the current state of the internet has really um um you know uh, kind of put us in this rut which is sad because the internet was not supposed to be it was supposed to do the opposite <laughs> but I, i've mentioned that in other videos that's a live stream. if i haven't done that one already i'm not even sure if i did i should just do a live stream on the internet <laughs> um, I, i'll put that on there i think i might have already done that but i'll put that in my notes here but while i do that i just want to sign off and thank everybody for tuning in Let's see. I can erase elitism. Yeah, I could put history of the internet. History of the internet. How it turned from uh, the world more connected <laughs> to the world more divided because <laughs> damn okay then <laughs> bye bye see you later